So chapter five, uh, we're going to talk about viruses today. And I'm going to start off with a little bit of sort of where viruses fit in. I'm a little history to kind of start. Um, one thing we know, viruses infect every type of cell, including bacteria, algae, fungi, protozoa, plants, animals, you name it. If it's alive, it can be infected by a virus. Now, do not misunderstand this to think that all viruses can infect all types of organisms. That's not the case. We just know that for every organism out there, there is a virus that can infect it. They are abundant and ubiquitous. There's that buzzword we talked about in the beginning, ubiquitous meaning everywhere. Uh, as an example of this, seawater can contain 100 million viruses per milliliter. If you don't know what a milliliter is, think about the first top joint of your pinky finger. Uh, that's about a milliliter's uh, worth of volume. Uh, so for those of you that are like, that like the ocean, you are swimming in viruses. The nice part about that is the vast majority of them cannot infect you. Okay? Uh, for a very, very long time, the cause of viral infections was unknown. We had no idea what was making people sick. Uh, Pasteur eventually hypothesized that it was some type of living thing that was smaller than a bacteria. And the smaller than a bacteria part comes in because he couldn't see it underneath a microscope. And Pasteur was used to being able to actually see bacteria at this point. Okay? Uh, the, t the term virus was coined after this. It is a Latin for poison. Uh, basically, the thought being that these very... T Eventually, two scientists actually isolated and showed viruses. Uh, Ivanovsky and Bajerink okay, uh, showed that t diseases in tobacco were created by a virus. Specifically, it's called tobacco mosaic virus, and it's one of the most commonly used viruses around today. Uh, it's actually still very widely studied. Uh, Lothar and Froch around the same time uh, discovered an animal virus causing foot and mouth disease in cattle. Now, no, this is not the same thing as hand, foot, and mouth disease in people. Okay? But these were our first foray into viruses. So, now, <clears throat> Since the discovery of viruses, a debate has sort of raged on. Uh, is it alive or isn't? Are these actually going to be considered living organisms? Well, it depends. Some people go, yes, they're alive. Some people, no, they're not. Uh, I, honestly, it doesn't matter which side of the debate you fall on as long as you have a good argument. So let's talk about why we could say either or. Okay. So... Viruses are unable to replicate independently from a host. In other words, they are completely dependent upon a host cell to make new viruses. Viruses cannot make their own new viruses. And we know that's not the case for other types of living organisms. Cells go through mitosis, meiosis, or binary fission. Organisms can make other organisms. Okay? Uh, even though viruses do not exhibit most of the life processes of cells, uh, they can direct them. Okay? Uh, and therefore, they're certainly a little bit more than molecules, okay, because they can control life processes. Now, that being said, the reality is viruses don't metabolize, but they can control metabolic processes in other organisms. So where do you draw the line? Okay. Uh, instead, for the most part, we choose to call them obligate intracellular parasites. Okay. Uh, they can't multiply unless they're inside of a specific host. Okay? And what they do is bring in their own genetic material and shut off the genetic material of the host, or at least some of the genetic material of the host, and redirect the host using the viral genetic material. Okay? So in other words, they sort of kick out the instructions that are in the normal cell okay? and replace it with instructions on how to make a new virus. Okay? They'll hijack all of the machinery that's inside of the cell Okay? and basically use it to turn the cell into a virus factory. Okay? Uh, instead of calling viruses alive or dead, it's much more appropriate to turn them active viruses, meaning that they can cause an infection, or inactive viruses, those that are unable to cause an infection for various reasons. Okay? So here are sort of the ins and outs of how you, know, you can classify the virus as living or dead uh, or not living. 
Okay. Uh, to be really honest, I'm going to stick with the active and inactive, and we won't call them alive and dead because if you don't metabolize, in my view, you're not alive. Okay. Now, viruses have also played a vital role in evolution. Okay. The evolution of humans, the evolution of other organisms. Okay. Because viruses can infect cells and actually influence the genetic makeup of those cells. They can change the DNA inside of a cell, leaving the cell alive and leaving that cell to reproduce and make more cells. So those changes that are caused by the viral infection get passed on to future generations. Okay? Because of this, viral infections will actually shape the way cells and tissues evolve. Okay? Things we've learned, about 10% of the human genome consists of sequences that come from viruses. So 10% of all of our DNA uh, we acquired over time through viral infection. Okay? It's actually more so when it comes to the bacteria, somewhere between 10 and 20% of bacterial DNA contains viral sequences. So they seem to actually pick up a, a larger amount or actually a, what we consider a greater percentage of DNA from viruses that infect them. Okay? But either way, 10% and 20% okay, are large amounts of DNA. Okay? This can be whole genes, whole sets of genes. Uh, so we're talking about being able to make entirely new proteins or the shutting off of proteins so that we're losing certain types of evolutionary traits. Before we start talking about what viruses are made of, let's talk a little bit about how big they are. So we said earlier they were very, very small. Okay? Uh, so small that Pasteur wasn't seeing them with the microscope. Um, the smallest viruses, uh, parvoviruses, somewhere around 20 nanometers in diameter. If you don't know what a nanometer is, it's a billionth of a meter. So imagine cutting a meter stick into one billion even pieces. That would be a nanometer. Um, in other words, very, very small. Uh, if you think about it, E. coli, the bacteria we see in the lab, this is one of our smaller bacteria, uh, about a thousandth of the size of these. So start dividing this up by a thousand. Okay. Uh, these are going to be extremely, extremely tiny. Because of this, you will not be seeing them under the microscope. Okay. The largest viruses, viruses like the Mimi virus, around 450 nanometers in length. Um, some of your cylindrical viruses can be quite long, okay, but are usually also very narrow, so they're still going to be very hard to detect. Okay. Uh, you see it right here. Like I said, this is an E. coli. Here is a portion of a red blood cell, uh, a highly coded Ebola virus, okay. uh, polio virus here, adenoviruses, common cold, rhinoviruses, also a lot of common cold. Okay. These are very, very small. Okay. So, we're going to talk about parts of the virus. Uh, these are not going to resemble cells at all. They're going to be extremely, extremely simplified. Uh, as far as naming the parts go, the parts themselves can be complex, but we're not going to delve into that at this point. Okay. Uh, and the simplified portion comes in because realistically, these guys are only going to bring with them what they need to invade a cell, control it, and have it replicate new viruses. Okay? So, the way I like to do this, and if you're following along, there is a chart okay, in the notes that goes with this. Okay. Let me get the white screen up. Is that I like to talk about how viruses are like peanut MMs. Yes, I know it's kind of crazy. Okay, so if you ask me, there are four. Okay? There are four parts to a peanut M&M, &M, and there are four parts to a virus. Okay, so probably sitting around thinking about what the four parts to an M&M &M right now are right now. And remember, it's a peanut M&M, &M, so okay, the all-important peanut. Okay the chocolate coating, okay, the hard candy shell so that it melts in your mouth and not in your hand, okay, and there's one more piece that we haven't really talked about, and that's the M, okay, 
If it's an M and M, it has that M emblazoned on it. Okay, so this okay, is your peanut M and M. Right, so in essence. A peanut M&M is basically a chocolate-covered peanut, okay? And chocolate-covered peanut, two main parts there, the chocolate and the peanut, okay? The candy coating and the M are optional. You still get the same effect with just the candy coating, or I'm sorry, with just the chocolate and the peanut, okay? So, viruses like peanut M&Ms uh, will have four portions, okay? Two of which are mandatory. You have got to have them. Every virus has them, okay? or what we would consider obligate pieces if we want to use terms from the last section, okay? And two other components that are optional. Some viruses have them, some viruses don't. Some have one or the other, okay? So, four main parts to a virus, okay? okay. We're going to talk about the obligate parts first, okay? Things you have to have. These are the ones I termed mandatory, okay? One, there has to be a genome. It's got to be some type of genetic material. When it comes to viruses, it's DNA or RNA. Okay. The or is a big deal. It's one or the other, never both. Okay. Write that down, never both. Viruses have DNA or RNA, but not both. Okay. The other obligate part is the coding. Okay. It's a protein coat called a capsid. Okay. All right, so protein coating called the capsid. So this is basically the peanut and the chocolate. Okay. Now the optional components include that candy coating, an additional coating, okay, called an envelope. Okay. And okay, what are essentially recognition factors, things that make the virus recognizable by other cells, okay, called spikes. Okay. I'm saying these are your M. Okay. Because you recognize it's an M&M, &M, it's got that M emblazoned on it. Okay. The spikes are basically used to dock to other cells. They help recognize appropriate cell types for the virus to attack. Okay. So, four parts to a virus, four parts to a peanut M&M. Okay. So, here we go. Uh, the external coating. Okay. Uh, that we call the capsid. Okay. Uh, a core with a nucleic acid, DNA or RNA, but remember, never both. Okay. Uh, it's possible that we can have an envelope, extra coating on the outside, and it's a possibility that there could be spikes. Okay. Sometimes they will carry with them one or two enzymes. These are not metabolic enzymes. They're usually something to help control the cell. Okay. Uh, once the virus has found its way inside of the host cell. You have to remember, these are host cell hijackers. They're taking over the host cell and forcing it to reproduce, okay? specifically to reproduce new viruses. Okay. So, here we go again. Capsids protein shell surrounding the nucleic acid. Okay. Uh, the nucleocapsid is what we call the capsid and the nucleic acid by themselves. Uh, Viruses that are missing that additional coating, okay, in other words, that are just chocolate-covered peanuts, uh, we refer to as naked viruses, and they only contain the nucleocapsid. Okay. Those that have the additional coating on the outside okay, uh, have the envelope. Okay. So this covers the nucleocapsid. Uh, usually this is a modified piece of host cell membrane. Basically, the virus is on their way out of the cell wrap themselves in host cell membrane, and this becomes a viral envelope. Okay. 
spikes. You can find them on naked or enveloped viruses. It just depends upon the virus. Um, these project from the outer surface of the cell. So for example, right here, these would be spikes. Lots of times you see them okay, looking something like this. So we get these projections on the outside of the cell. Okay. So these would be spikes. Okay. Uh, their main goal of having spikes is allowing the viruses to dock with the host cells. Uh, those spikes sort of work as attachment sites. Uh, they'll grab on or attach to receptors or other types of proteins found on the surface of a host cell. Okay. Now, a fully formed virus that's actually able to establish an infection inside of another cell is referred to as a virion. Okay? So, viruses that have all of their necessary components and are able to establish an infection in another cell are referred to as virions. Okay? Now, this little guy right here, do not get caught up okay, in this particular type of virus. These are the ones that TV shows like to show us because, well, this guy is scary. Okay. It looks like a nice little sort of alien spider. Okay. Uh, be aware that no matter how many times they show you this on TV as a virus infecting someone, uh, the reality is this is a type of virus known as a bacteriophage. Okay. And we'll talk a lot more about bacteriophages eventually, but bacteriophages only infect bacteria. Viruses like this can never infect humans. Okay. Now, when it comes to naming and classifying viruses, this is done very, very differently than it is with bacteria. Because viruses are not considered living organisms, they're not going to have a binomial nomenclature. So that two name naming system does not apply here. Okay. So <clears throat> we classify them by things like the type of disease they cause, uh, what they're made of, so their chemical composition, in other words, is it an RNA virus or a DNA virus? Is it enveloped? Is it not enveloped? What type of RNA does it have? What type of DNA does it have? And then we start breaking it down very specifically into the types of diseases that they cause or the types of hosts that they will infect. Okay. So your overall structure of a virus, you can see this one's a naked virus. It just has the capsid, okay, no additional outer coating spikes in the nucleic acid. This one has the additional outer coating and the spikes. This is what we consider an enveloped virus. Uh, you could also call this a non-enveloped virus and you would still be correct. Okay. Both terms apply. The term naked virus is just a little bit more commonly used. Let's talk a little bit about the capsid. Okay. Now, this is the most identifiable feature of a virus, mainly because it, it's what you can see. It's what's on the outside. Um, capsids are basically polymers. Okay. Composed of individual monomers called capsomeres. Okay. And capsomeres will actually spontaneously self-assemble to finish the capsid. This makes it very simple for the virus to reproduce. It just needs to produce lots of capsomeres. And those lots of capsomeres will eventually naturally grab onto one another and come together to make a capsid. Okay. There are different versions of capsid. Uh, you can have helical capsids. Okay. That would be this guy right here. Okay. Where the, <clears throat> excuse me, helical capsids, okay, uh, where the capsomeres come together to sort of coil around the nucleic acid, okay, uh, what is called an icosahedral capsid, uh, this one, it means 20 faces. The icosahedral capsids, what you're seeing here is they usually have this sort of soccer ball look to them. I always think the Epcot ball, okay. Uh, so all of these triangular capsomeres coming together, see the triangle right here, okay. uh, the capsomeres come together to make these triangles and the triangles self-assemble. Every single one of these little individual dots in here, okay. 
you see where I'm pointing, all these little individual dots would be an individual capsomere. And then a complex capsid, that's what we're seeing in the bacteriophage, the scary looking one. Okay? It's sort of it's sort of including both types okay, of the helical and icosahedral. There, there are multiple components okay, when it comes to the complex capsid. So, uh, the envelope, again, envelope is acquired from the host cell, okay? It's basically stealing a piece of membrane from the host cell. The most common place to get membrane from is the actual cell membrane, okay? Uh, so we can see it here. This particular virus is actually being basically exocytosed, okay, out of the host cell, you can see it, okay, as the virus is sort of exocytose, it's going to take a piece of this host cell with it. Now, the virus will actually modify the membrane before it uses it, before it grabs it on the way out. And that modified membrane will have spikes and other types of glycoproteins on it uh, in order to suit the virus's needs. Okay. It's also possible to uh, acquire envelope from the nuclear envelope, so nuclear membrane, okay. or envelope can be acquired from endoplasmic reticulum. You gotta remember all of these are membrane bound sections of the cell, so they all have membrane available to wrap virus in. Now, the viral envelope will be very different from the host cell membrane. The virus is going to modify it before it grabs that membrane and just sort of coats itself in it. Uh, some or all of the regular membrane proteins are going to be replaced with viral proteins. Uh, some envelope proteins are made to attach to the capsid so that the envelope and the capsid are attached to one another. Okay. Uh, and it's highly likely that glycoproteins or spikes, okay, so spikes are glycoproteins, okay, uh, will be added to the outside of the envelope, okay. Now, envelope viruses are pleomorphic. They're going to have a variable shape and range from spherical to filamentous. So they can look string-like, they can look circular. It's really, really going to depend, okay. So you can see it here. This is a normal, okay, helical virus. This one is non-enveloped or naked. Uh, when it's enveloped, okay, uh, basically this is coiled up inside of the envelope. We get lots of varieties of shapes. So there's no constant shape in an enveloped virus, okay. Um, the naked icosahedral virus, again, you can see the little individual capsomeres here, okay. Once they're coated with envelope, Okay. They're coded in several different ways. So again, pleomorphic. Okay. There's a word we've used many times before, and okay, we're used to it, and our old friend, the bacteriophage. Okay. And this complex capsid. Okay. So this ends part one of chapter seven, come back for part two, and we will talk a little bit more about actually using the viruses and what happens once they get inside of cells.